So when I was a youngster, one of the favorite things that I loved to do was to get out as much Play-Doh as I could. And then just whatever struck my imagination, I would take that and try to replicate it. And I tried to fashion whatever else I could. And yes, if you're wondering, just like my kids, get it in the carpet and on the couch. So when I was thinking of the topic today about actually coming and seeing Jesus, and I got to thinking about how we then perceive Jesus. And uh, I have my little figure up here, and we'll put the picture up there in case you can't see it. And it's, I mean, this is absolutely horrendous. And evidently my skills are still like that when I was in kindergarten. (laughs) But I think as Christians, there's a lot of times, and I think we just in the construct of this world, is that we create the Jesus that we need. That far too often we create the Jesus that, al- that allows us to live in the life that we choose to live, to live in the fashion that we hope to live. Because one of the draws as a pastor is when I get to talk to people is to try to hope to convince them that the Jesus that they have created in their mind might not be the Jesus of the Scripture. Instead, is some facsimile that is allowing them to live in a life that they shouldn't. Because, see, we spend a lot of time creating the Jesus we need instead of the Jesus that is. And today, as we unpack the scriptures, let us focus today on the divinity of God, the life-changing presence of God, and the way that he sculpts and moves who he is and how we walk. And hopefully we don't end up looking like this. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, just to speak your word. I want to thank you for allowing me to be here with my brothers and sisters in the faith, allowing us to just praise your name and to give you all the glory. Lord, I just ask that you lead today, that you take center stage, that it not be about anything Phil or even the elders or anybody on stage, but it be all about you and your presence. Allow us, Lord, to... Get a firmer grasp on what this thing called divinity is. And be able to sculpt a relationship with you that is more in keeping with your word, in your presence, and in your truth. Amen. So, of course, like I talked about, we're in the middle of our Come and See series. And when I think of this Come and See series, and I I think about like coming alongside and actually trying to seek out Jesus is kind of the opposite of our clay bottle, right? Because like I horribly created this monstrosity in hopes that I'm trying to create something that affects me of what I think. But instead, the come and see is to leave all of your perceptions aside, all of the nuances in your head about Jesus, and come and see who he really is. And so when I think about that, I think about that Uh, about that imagery of a pupil and its teacher, to where he's coming alongside, the pupil's coming alongside the teacher, and really just following in his footsteps and just getting to know him better, getting to hear his wisdom and his knowledge and take everything in. So as we continue along our sermon series today, and we start talking about his divinity, I think that draws a great parallel for us because we're coming to see who Jesus is because of his divinity because of his presence in our lives. And it's because of what God has done through Jesus Christ, because of the cross, because of the tomb, because of his resurrection, that we get to know him better and we get to see who he truly is. And for those of you who don't know it, and that fancy term, just divinity, essentially mean that Jesus is God. And when we're talking about divinity, it was pretty cool because our Come and See series starts right off in the book of John, John 1. And in John 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him, in Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. 
And we're going to put up some slides to where we're going to go through and probably go through it faster than you could probably write down. So uh, if you want the passages later, I'm more than happy to give them to you. Uh, what I figure I do is I just walk through some real quick. When we're talking about this word divinity, kind of what does that mean? Uh, it first means that he existed eternally before he came to earth as, as man. And then next, he is included in Scripture as a member of the Trinity. So Jesus being Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Jesus is part of the Trinity. And he is described as God. He's described in Scripture as God becoming man. Then he is given the names, name of God in Scripture. And then he and the Father are stated to be one. And so I just encourage you, if, I know I went through those kind of fast, but if you would like those scriptures later, just please come up and see me. I'll give those to you. But I encourage you to read the scripture and to kind of see that divinity of God and see the miracles that he performed uh, throughout scripture and allowing you to see how he is sculpting things and not how we want to sculpt him. And so today when we talk about his divinity, we're going to talk about we're going to be in uh, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, where we talk about the story, like Steve talked about earlier, about the feeding of the 5,000. So if you could, go ahead and stand with me and let us read God's word. It says, After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. Jesus went up a mountain, sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so that, we, so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There, will, there was plenty of grass in that place. So they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves. After giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this truly is the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. So just kind of shut this short context, and Steve painted a good picture already this morning that, of course, this gospel, or this miracle, rather, is the only one that is in all four of the gospel. And then as we start going through the passage piece by piece, the first thing that it says there is that after this, those two words at the foremost of this passage just said, after this. He, went to this, he went across the Sea of Galilee. So what is this after this? And then so if we go back to John 5, he talks about how there was a man that had been disabled for 38 years, and he healed him. And it became widely known within Jerusalem, and they were wondering about this sign. And of course, he had been healing the sick throughout Jerusalem. And so he started getting this notoriety. And at that time, of course, we have Passover is getting ready to start. And so you have a lot of people who are typically not in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem at that time. So it's not hard to perceive that all of a sudden there would be been a, quite a huge following because the streets were packed. There have been rumors that were circulating. And so he retreated to that mountain that we talked about. And that mountain is actually called Bethsaida. And Bethsaida, if you even look today, it is actually a really awesome, lush, green area. Showing how scripture just lines up with what even is 
still today. Because there's a delta that's right off of the Sea of Galilee. And scholars think this town called Bethsaida, which was this ancient town, was actually the place where this miracle took place. And of course, as they were, Jesus was up on this mountain with his disciples, all of a sudden there was this huge crowd of like, if it says 5,000 men, which then would probably translate to probably over 20,000 people. Now, Angie and I, we like to go to uh, these Christian music festivals in the summer. And when you go to those, and they have these huge open fields, and there are thousands upon thousands of people, and they take those aerial shots, and it is crazy how many people. So I kind of imagine that scene, right? So there's this side of the mountain, and no matter what direction you're looking in, you can see everyone. And we like to try to get there early, and so we try to get up there fairly close. But then when we look back, all that we can really see is just a huge crowd seeing nothing else. So we've got to think Jesus is standing there with his disciples, and there is just this crowd just about as far as they can see. So now they're left with this problem because Jesus, being the shepherd he is, wants to help his people and make sure that everyone is taken care of. So he turns to Philip and asks him this kind of this trick question, right? He says, Philip, where will we buy that bread so that these people can eat? And he asked this to test him. And so to me, I'm thinking if I'm Philip at that time, I'm like, this is kind of an unfair question. Like, like there's no really good solution to this that I can see. And um, any of you married men out there um, know of a trick question or two you've been asked by your wife? Like, you know, does these pants make my hips look big? Do you like my mom? Some, some, some questions that, you know, we kind of know the answer to, but we're really afraid. Because if we'd say, no, those don't look big. Yeah, right. And do you like my mom? Sure. And then often I get the question from Andy, what are you thinking? And I'm going to tell you the truth, and I'm going to speak for the guys. So ladies, I'm going to go ahead and speak for the guys in the room. We're really thinking about nothing. (laughs) She's going to be point blank. She asked me that, and I, like, literally nothing. She goes, you can't be just thinking about nothing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. Because I'm either thinking about nothing, Star Wars, or what the Dolphins, or who the Dolphins are going to draft in the upcoming NFL draft. That's pretty much my lot in life. But when we ask this trick question to Philip, there's already, of course, the answer, since he knew what he was going to do. There's his answer in his mind, but he's leading Philip down now this path to the right answer. And Philip doesn't quite understand this. So this is where we kind of have our solution, number one. Here's what I see. And that's typically what we do, right? So we are, we're uh, presented a problem. We were like, well, here's what I see that I have. I'm like, now what do I do with this? And oftentimes we're left because we're going like, well, I don't have a solution. I, this is really not going to do the trick, especially when we, we face the hard things in life. Because as Philip is standing there and Jesus is asking this question to him, he's sitting there holding a bag going, I've got six, I got uh, 200 denarii which in that time would have been about six to eight months of wages. And he's looking at this huge crowd and goes, like, uh, it's not even enough for everybody to have a bite. I'm like, I, what am I supposed to do with this? So the only thing he knows to do is present like what he has and what he sees as a solution, but he's not really seeing the solution that's in front of him. And we do that a lot of times too, don't we? We sit there and go, well, I'm limited based upon what I have right now and not what God can do. Because see, what's of these questions, the question that Philip was asked, and these type of questions in our life, these kind of trick questions or hard to manage questions, the only thing they really are is a predicament with no real human solution. There's really no human solution for this, and that's the quandary that Philip is in. And so he asks him, going like, he's looking at this going, what am I supposed to do now, Jesus? You want me to go buy a bunch of, am I supposed to really go buy bread? And I see these multitude of people. What am I supposed to do? And then we have solution number two with Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He comes up and he's got this kid and he says, hey, here's what I have. I have this little boy and he's got five loaves of bread and two fish. 
And he goes, well, what is this for so many people? So now we have two, two perplexed disciples who are showing them what they can see and what they have. And they said, but what is this for so many? And we do that too, is that God tells us to go and do something, to accomplish something with our lives. But we look at what we see and then what we have, and we go, well, what am I really supposed to do? This is no way that this is going to work, Jesus. It's just not. But the one thing that we keep missing out on is the real solution. Jesus. Jesus is the answer. I kind of like it, view because we often tell, like, when we have uh, crossover basketball, and we ask a question sometimes, and I'll ask the kids, and of course they know they're at a church league, and I'll ask them a hard question, and because they know they have no other response, they just say, Jesus? And I'm like, spot on. I mean, I can't argue with that. So now we have this real solution of Jesus. So as we keep going through our passage, it says, Jesus says, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, fish as much as they needed. So now the disciples finally have the answer to the predicament that has no human solution. Jesus. And this is the power of it all. Because here, in the, that one question, if we go back to that one question that Jesus asked Philip. He says, where will we buy bread so that people can eat? And I think what Philip hears, what are you going to do to feed these people? Or you need to go get with the disciples and feed these people. And then that's what we do. We say, well, I, I see that there's a problem with no human solution, really. But what am I supposed to do? What am I going to do with this problem? But what Philip misses out on is on a key word in that sentence. We. Jesus doesn't ask Philip, what are you going to do about this problem? He says, what are we going to do about this problem? So not long ago, about two, three weeks ago, um, we decided that we, well, we really want to get a water softener for a house. And like, we really need one. And so I asked my buddy Jose Garcia to come over. And I said, hey, all I'm really asking for is to come over, have dinner, and let's look at a solution. Let's kind of just figure out, can you help me? Because the, the way the water lines are in my house, like half of them are hidden, and I can't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out if, even if everything was perfect. So I asked him, I was like, well, can you just show me what I need to do? So he came over, and I got a little dry erase board in my basement. And he's drawing up this crazy diagram. He's like, all right, well, your discharge line is going to go here, and your water line is going to go here, and then you're going to run this down here, and you're going to cut out this board, and you're going to place this here, you're going to place that there. You put these valves here, you put a shutoff valve, and you put another shutoff valve here. And honestly, I kind of hit the guy thing where I'm going, I got that. That's not a problem. I'm like, oh, yeah, man, I got this. He even gave me like a laundry list of supplies that I need, and I'm like, oh, I got this. About two days later, I went back down to look at this diagram, and I go, Eh, no. This, no way is this going to happen. So I called up Jose, and I won't lie, with kind of the hope in mind that maybe he'll come and help me because I know how experienced he is with these things. And so sure enough, Jose goes in. He actually goes to Menards, picks up all the supplies, comes over, and helps me install it. And what would take me probably two days with like about 3,000 errors took him less than two hours. And why? Because he brought the right equipment. He has the wisdom, the know-how, the knowledge to make it all work properly. If I would have done it, I probably would have been showering at your house. <laughs> well, it should come no surprise since we were finally getting a water softener in our house that about three days later, I wake up, go work out, come back, and my water heater doesn't work. And when I'm looking up online, it's likely because the sediment that was in the line, now that it was actually getting water that was, you know, not horrible, clogged up my water heater and busted it. So now I'm stuck with the predicament. So who do I call? Jose, not Ghostbusters. I call Jose and I say, hey man, I got this problem. I can't figure it out. And so he, being an awesome individual he is, he's like, all right, I'll be over about noon. And of course, he comes over, and I'm just, I'm like, that's kind of what I was aiming for, because I'm just like, I'm not doing this. 
And so he course comes over, we go buy a water heater, the supplies really fast and throw it in. And again, less than a two hour, less than a couple hours later. But again, it's because I relied on somebody that definitely had the know-how, the wisdom, and, and the tools all to make this happen. Because you see, Jesus asked that question to Philip in such a way that shows that he never intended for the solution to be done by Philip alone. He, ex- he was hoping by just knowing of Jesus' divine nature, even though he knew the way Philip was going to answer, he was setting up a way so Philip could hopefully see that Jesus, by his divine nature, would be the real solution. And when we think of Philip, couldn't get the answer. We think that Andrew can get the answer. But then what we're going to do is we come down to a little math time. So in college, I actually took this like really extensive math course. Because I, at the time at least, really loved math. And it was a 600 level class to where you were in class three times a week for two hours. And we had to deconstruct the number sy- numbering system. And it just took about everything in me to squeak out a B. But I remember I really loved that class because we were so heavily involved in that. So this morning, we're gonna, instead, we're going to do some easy math. No hard, complicated equations. No long, drawn-out explanations. Instead, we're going to look at what Andrew came up with. He brought Jesus five loaves and two fishes. Because he knew that, that five loaves and that two fishes equaled not enough, right? Because he said, here's what I got, but I'm still in the problem. What is this for so many? But then what Jesus showed then by feeding so many, his five loaves plus two fish plus Jesus equaled more than enough. Because of Jesus in the mix of it, his divinity equaled more than enough. By Jesus' divinity, it comes from being an impossible solution to a solution that exceeds expectations. Because of the we, the solution moves from not being enough to well more than enough. And then we see in that passage, when they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled the 12 baskets of the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. There was more than enough. And when I think of sitting down to dinner and having more than enough, I think of when I was at DOD and I had to go down to Edinburgh every once in a while, and there's this little diner that's off the beaten path. And we would go to that, go to that diner, and I'm telling you right now, there was no portion control at that location. Instead, I, and so every time I would go there, I would order the tenderloin. And there's one of those good Indiana tenderloins, right, where the bread is about the side of a coaster and your tenderloin's about the size of the table, right? And to where I, like, I remember the first time I went there and I was like, this is awesome because I now have meals for the rest of the week. And I did. But that is what God is talking about. He is more than enough. He has this small thing that we, that we have that we can bring him, but he says... If you add that to me, then it'll be more than enough. And I love that imagery because after it's over with, right, he's like, well, thou, there's 12 baskets left over. And why was there 12 baskets left over? Well, it's pretty simple. There's 12, 12, uh, 12 disciples, right? So each disciple got a little disciple doggy bag. And so when we notice that, how God works, when we notice his intricate nature and his divinity and how he sculpts and how he moves things. And then that's what we get to do. We get to take what is not enough by human condition and we hand it to Jesus to be more than enough. And it's far too often as humans, we choose the first option, which sells our relationship with Jesus short. Because like, sure, I believe in Jesus. Sure, he's the leader of my life. But I'll go ahead and take care of all of this over here. But that is not the answer to the equation. When we come to see who Jesus truly is and his divinity in action, then we benefit from his great solution. Five loaves plus two fish equals not enough. 
But five loaves plus two fish plus Jesus equals more than enough. Amen? Five loaves plus two fish plus Jesus equals more than enough. Because of this, the outcome drastically changes when Jesus is in the equation. The outcome drastically changes when Jesus is in the equation. The outcome drastically changes when Jesus is in the equation. Your lack plus Jesus equals overflow. Your problem plus Jesus equals problem solved. Your chaos plus Jesus equals calm. Your failures plus Jesus equals success. Your suffering plus Jesus equals mercy. Your your pain plus Jesus equals healing. Your emptiness plus Jesus equals fulfilled. Your addiction plus Jesus equals freedom. Your anger plus Jesus equals love. Your anxiety plus Jesus equals hope. Your struggle plus Jesus equals peace. Your broken marriage plus Jesus equals restoration. And your sin plus Jesus equals forgiveness. And that math works every day single time. I want to encourage you this morning to not let another day go by without taking what you have, adding Jesus, and living the way that Jesus wants, living out the life that he wants, Because he doesn't want you to live in a broken marriage. He doesn't want you to live with pain, with with, with, with struggle, with addiction. Instead, he wants you to add him to the equation and be forgiven and set free. So what we're going to do is, I want you to close your eyes for me. And I want you to raise your hand this morning if you're dealing with any kind of pain. If you're dealing with any kind of struggle, any kind of addiction, any kind of sin, hopelessness, hurt. If you are dealing with any kind of struggle that is keeping you from knowing Jesus better, because I know I am. And as your eyes are closed, I want you to lift your hands high. And I want you to take that addiction, that pain, that hurt, And I want you to give it right now to Jesus. Because your addiction, your pain, your struggle, whatever you're lifting up right now, plus Jesus equals restoration in him. Let us not go another day as a church family, as followers in Christ, carrying what God never wanted us to carry. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. With these hands lifted high, Lord, I'm asking that you work a miracle this morning. That you would take these struggles, these addictions, these pains, the broken marriages, the broken relationships, and just take them, Lord. Add yourselves to them, Lord. Lord, let us lean into you with everything that we have and to place these on you. Also, that we can sculpt a better relationship with you. So that we're not just left with a Play-Doh pile of mush, but instead are miraculous, live out the, as the miraculous creation that you have created us to be. Let us not choose solution A. Let us not choose solution B. But Lord, be with us and help us to choose solution Jesus. Amen.